Hello. <laughs> Wake up. Hi, everybody. Are you all out there awake, ready to have some estimation fun? Yeah. Woo! Let's hear it for estimation. Woo! Okay, we're ready, I think. Do you know any more like energizing exercises we could do? Energizing exercises? Everyone raise their hands now. Yes. Okay, good. One more time. All right. I can really feel the enthusiasm here. Okay, perfect. Okay. Got it. All right. I put in this in lock, right? <laughs> so some short interactions here. First of all, Shannon, the 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 instigator of this thing. <laughs> Do you want to switch? Oh, here we are. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shannon Vitas. I have been working with Drupal for a few years now and doing project management for about six years, and I'm currently taking a short break between jobs to do some work on Drupal 8 and work with the initiative owners and uh, come talk to me afterwards if you have questions or you want to talk more about project management. Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Matthias Axelsson from Happiness Web Agency in um, Stockholm, Sweden. And I'm the CEO of Happiness and also a certified Scrum Master. All right, uh, and I'm Jacob, the estimation guy. Uh, who was uh, invited by Shannon to take part in this, and I happily accepted. I've been doing Drupal since 2005, uh, and I'm one of the co-founders of Node 1, now Wunderkraut. All right. Uh, so this is a panel, originally, but we figured it would be better to do some talk in the beginning, to maybe raise some topics and uh, get some ideas going. So. When we're doing our part here, if you come up with any ideas, questions, or anything, feel free to tweet. Here's the hashtag. At the end, we're going to go through the question list, and we're going to ask you questions as a panel. That's the second part of this presentation. In case you can't see it, it says Drestimate, like Drupal estimate. Yeah. Drestimate. All right. So why are you here? OK, so when someone asks you what you know, to do an estimation for me. How many people have this reaction right here? <laughs> Kitty scared. Not good. How many of you have this one? Sad kitty, doesn't like estimation. What about this one? <laughs> I'm going to straight up murder you if you want me to do an estimation. No. Well, I hope it's not any of those. But if it is, guess what? You're in the right room. We're here to talk about this. And at the end, if I don't skip over the slide, there it is. At the end, what we really want is for you to feel like Happy Kitty. Doing your little estimation dance. I know what I'm doing. So we're going to cover what is an estimate, what not to use them for, what affects them, and how you can do it. And then at the end, you get to ask your questions. So remember to use that hashtag. We're going to be checking the feed so that we can get those questions. All right. <clears throat> so what is an estimate? So the technical explanation of estimate is it's a calculated, calculated approximation of a result which is useful even if input data may be incomplete or certain. You know, like we said, essentially, with the little information you have, try to come up with a likely scenario. And uh, we believe that a lot of you are product managers. Is that true? How many of you are product managers? All right, so majority. So you're probably, this is you. Uh, that's the idea anyway. You're a lady. Deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> and these are the questions you have. <laughs> what is it, what's in an estimate, and what advice can we give you? All right. So estimates concern work, uh, some kind of like the effort required to finish a project. And estimates, estimates should uh, encompass a number of tasks, and not just the work itself. Uh, so if you look at all the bubbles here and arrows, first of all, we have the, the bubbles to the left, the loop, the iterative work you do, including uh, re uh, requirements clarification, uh, writing use cases, UI refinement, theming development, and testing. And then when the project is over, you also need to figure out how to put the site live, deploy it, and you also, in many cases, you also need to provide training for the customer. And during the whole course of the project, you will try and be required as a project manager to, to provide guidance and to make steer the project. 
Right, so um, on to requirements, uh, requirements clarification. <coughs> um, so one example how you can clarify requirements is by working with use cases. Now, a lot of, a lot of requirements come in terms of user stories. Is this a format you guys are familiar with, user stories? Yep. All right, can we see some hands? All right, so I don't think they need any further explanation. User stories are pretty brief. They talk about who does something, what they do, why. Uh, use cases, on the other hand, they will be more extensive. That's what a developer would need to actually to, to clear out all ambiguities and all different ways you can interpret a requirement. So that's something you probably need to do for a lot of the functionality in order for developers to really understand what the customer needs to do. And this is going to take time. And this is something you need to estimate for. Um, likewise, the UI. Often it starts with a simple, with a simple mock-up, sometimes with a wireframe. And over the course of the project, as you understand more about the product requirements, they go from wireframe to maybe a comp to maybe a finished mock-up. Uh, the real work. This is what we usually think about when we estimate. This is stuff we estimate, but it's just a fraction of everything. The coding and the theming and, and all the, everything that's included there. Testing. Testing can be as simple as having someone click around the website and see there aren't any bugs or any defects. But in bigger projects, it becomes more and more important to do automated testing. Big products become so big that you can't possibly, as a human being, figure out every combination of content or pages or anything. And you also have what we call regression errors, bugs that reappear or appear later. Something that used to work suddenly doesn't work because you did something that broke the functionality. And the best way to Avoid that is to have an automated test. And an automated test is simply a piece of software to make sure that the other piece of software does what it should. And again, this is something else you need to take into account. Um, finally, uh, finally, training. Training your customers. <clears throat> training editors, training staff, anyone who's going to use the website. How it works and, and, and what they need to think about. In this slide, what you can see, it's also included deployment. And even if you're not deploying the site, even if the customer's IT department is doing it, they're going to have tons of, tons of questions. You're probably going to have to be like a Drupal sysops consultant. And that's time that's going to take time, and you need to take that into account and charge for it. All right, so the, the PM part here. So I'm talking about this because I've seen this happen a lot in the boffs that I've been holding. People don't always account for PM time um, or even a percentage of it. and I'm here to tell you that's a really big mistake. That's really, really common in estimation. Always include your PM time. It's valuable. It's going to keep everything on track. Account for it and plan for it in your estimations. And we're going to tell you the percentage that we usually do later on in, in Jacob's part. All right. My clicker is not working. All right. So why do we need estimates? Well. So these are the questions that prompt this section. How does an estimate help you plan the project? What does it communicate, and how does it help your budget? Now, estimates are for good and for bad. And we're going to get to the bad later. Used for planning, budgeting, and communicating regarding the project, around the project. Planning is the most obvious and common use for, uh, for estimates. Say, for example, that say for example, you estimate the project will take 20 hours. You know that each of your team members can work 32 hours per week. That would mean that they could work for essentially five days. And including that is also project management time. Um, like this. Ah, you got your calendar planned. Perfect. That's one way to use your estimate. It will give you an indication how, for how many days you need to book your resources. Your developers, your testers, your themers, your designers. And that's also often assuming that the project will be like a straight road. You know, the, the pedal to the metal and just raise ahead. But in reality, projects usually turn out more like this, like an old packet trail up in the Andes with mudslides you know, and, and holes and, 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 and even worse. And more often than we'd like, it looks like a traffic jam in New York. These are things that happen. And a lot many estimates and many project plans don't take this into account. And how can it happen? Well, a lot of projects are scheduled like this. This is a team, or this is a small team at a, at a company. 
and they are managing three projects in parallel. Project B, for example, is, uh, is planned to take seven days, but, uh, but about a week later, a week and a half later, customer comes back and tells them they have a, they need a few major adjustments, and this is super important. So you, your team has to work weekend. Uh, meanwhile, project A is running, the green one here. And it, it, everything looks fine, you know. It's, everything's running on time, you're really happy. Until like two and a half weeks later, it turns out you have tons of bugs, and they are, they are business critical. Maybe it's an e-commerce site, and they're not making any money. They're losing money every second. And, and, and meanwhile, you're run, running project C. And with this kind of planning, what's going to happen is you're going to have a very tired development team eventually. Yeah. And they're not going to be that cute, I think. Uh, so budgeting. <clears throat> so here's the second part. The customer. What can it get and for what money? Um, essentially, what they want and what they're prepared to pay. Uh, a lot of cases, customers know what they want, but you don't know how much effort it's going to take at the end of the project. Do you, know how much, you don't know how much the box weighs until by the end. Uh, it makes it easy if the customer can put a price tag on it. You can actually have an idea of, of its worth to the customer in terms of business value. But that is not always the case. If the customer can provide an estimate of how much value each of these features provide for them, you got halfway. I mean, that, that's, that, that's good progress, because uh, I'm going to show you later why that's useful information. And suddenly, we can weigh the business value against the budget. All right, this doesn't tell us the whole picture, because I actually need to, need to estimate how much time it's going to take. And for that, you need to use your team. Your team can rate the feature in terms of how complex it is, how familiar you are with it, and whether it's depending on, on other functions they built, or, or external APIs, or, or such factors that will influence the time it takes to complete it. And they can post it as a yellow post-it, like I said there, on the side of the box. So they think that this box here, which has a business value of 100 euros, would take 80 to 20 hours to deliver. Uh, so with this information, we can suddenly compare the estimated effort compared to the money they have. And that is provided, well, provided this information is pretty accurate, you can make some interesting, you can make some choices here now. Uh, we can, if we put the value and the effort slash risk on two axes here. Now, the effort risk, I'm going to explain that briefly. Uh, the more effort something takes, usually that also reflects in higher risk. So something that takes two and hours to make usually has a higher risk of running over that estimate proportionally. You want to usually want to go for the things in the sweet spot, the low-hanging fruit, the things that are easy to do and deliver a lot of customer the value to the customer. And reversely, they're the stuff you want to avoid, the red sector, the stuff that's that's expensive and doesn't deliver a lot of value. That's stuff you would rather actually avoid at all if you could. Then you have this stuff that actually brings a lot of value but a lot of work. But on the other hand, if it's a lot of work, there's a lot of risk, which means that it could potentially run over budget. <clears throat> so using this grid here, this quadrant, you can rearrange your features and get a visual idea of, of what stuff you should go after first and what stuff that's most, you know, could potentially run over budget. Generally, you want to go for the low-hanging fruit and for the hard stuff first. So the top left and top right are probably the ones you would want to plan early in the project and get done with so you can focus on the, the riskier and less valuable stuff later on. And, but this assumes that the team is actually pretty sure. But they won't be sure until the end of the project, usually. You, you don't have a clue about uh, the difficulty. And you want to turn that think into what they know, not what they think, but what they know. So finally, um, estimates aren't just numbers. They aren't just lists of numbers and, 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 and features, and, and they actually tell a lot more. Your team wants to make sure the customer understands what they're asking for, and the customer wants to make sure that your team understands what they're expecting. In many situations, when you get an RFP, Answering with the lowest estimates, you should not what you should do. You should actually come up with a number where the customer feels is, 
it's uh, reliable. The communicates that you understand the complexity of the task and that you have the required experience to completing it. <coughs> and if you're in good terms, you have the same estimates. And but now everything goes well. You're friends with your customer. <coughs> so. So yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, risk and risk management. Can I ask uh, how many of you are using risk management in your pro projects? Uh, yeah, some of you. You probably already know everything I'm going to say. <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's much easier to estimate with, uh, uh, for, for existing uh, clients. Uh, it's much harder for a potential or new client because you don't have any insights about their business needs and you don't have any experience from working with them. So you're kind of on unknown territory. Clicker. <laughs> don't hog the clicker, Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. It's on the right. It's, it's on the right, yeah. in the arrow. There you go. Yeah, there we go. I, I actually served in the Swedish Army, and uh, one thing I learned from there is that risk management can help you see when the map and the territory don't agree. And let's look at some of the burning questions here. Uh, why should I care so, so much about risk early on? How do I manage and communicate risk? And are there common risks with Drupal? And uh, what's the point of all these questions? Of course, we want to help you to avoid unpleasant surprises and car wrecks, like this fine transom all crashed. Yeah. Don't hassle the half. Don't hassle the half. He doesn't like to be hassled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, in, when you perform a risk analysis, what are the steps? There are three simple steps. The, identification phase, the assessment phase, and the mitigation phase. And let's start looking at the uh, risk identification phase. Here, you, uh, here you're going to try to identify all the factors that may jeopardize the success of the project. And uh, of course, experience is a key component here. If you've been in the business for several years, some of the Pits, pitfalls are obvious, but if you uh, it also uh, it's really important with uh, knowledge and, uh, and experience with the client, so it can be a good idea to survey users and stakeholders and try to ask and extract knowledge from the client. And uh, what, what is risk? Two factors, impact and probability. Uh, sometimes it's quite obvious if, a, if there is a critical risk, but if you don't, if, it's, if it isn't obvious, you can use a tool called composite risk index or composite risk rating to, to evaluate, uh, evaluate the risk. And it's kind of uh, easy. It's, uh, you value the impact and the probability on a scale one to five. So let's look here on the index. Here's the index with the identified risks. We got a video component rated as a high risk. Both impact and probability are rated high, so the risk rating is uh, maximum. The integration is medium risk. It's uh, like uh, uh, quite high on both numbers. and. Uh, Migration is quite a low risk, and the asteroid is extreme. It's, uh, it can be um, uh, it, it can be called a, a black swan, yeah. and uh, uh, like a asteroid, it's really extreme. But uh, uh, an example from the reality is the pizza incident I had with my team um, some year ago. Me and all the dev team went to a pizzeria, had pizza. Everybody had the same pizza. Everybody got a stomach disease. We're knocked out for a couple of days. <laughs> the projects were a bit late, and uh, uh, it, it wasn't so fun. And uh, to um, manage the risk, I could have sent half the team to McDonald's. 
but still, that's uh, maybe a bit too much. So, well, big consultancies, they sort of split their team on two aircraft. So in case one crashes, you know, it's, it's not the death yeah. of the company. <laughs> so, but, it, you know, like a pizzeria is a perfect example, I think. Yeah. So don't forget about the black swans. Yeah, watch out for them. Yeah, yeah. And you go out to dinner tonight. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's look at some monitoring. Yeah. Okay, so this is an example of risk management and classification. So if you've got high level risks that are in that red zone between 17 to 25, this is your opportunity to say, okay, how do I wanna manage this and how often really do I wanna look at these risks? Because you're not gonna look at your risks every single day. But if you have some that are in that high region, maybe it's a good opportunity to look at them um, on a daily basis if they are going to completely blow up your project or look at them for triggers. What's, what's an example of this risk is really active and happening right now on a weekly basis for um, some of those high ones and then all the way down to maybe you ignore them if they're really, really not important. They have not much impact and you can totally accept that risk. So, um, next. thank you. Here's an example of what you would do then. Once you've got your nice little risk register and you've listed out your risks and you're aware of them, you're doing your estimation process and you know how these things might, might affect you. One thing that you can do to communicate this risk clearly to your stakeholders is to do a risk chart. So this basically has your impact up here on the right side and your probability down below. And if you've got something that's got an impact of two and a probability of four like the migration here, you stick it in that slot up two over four that's migration, that's where that lives. So this is a sort of low risk that you don't want to med you know, monitor a lot. And I've even gone ahead and scheduled some special classifications at the top. Um, so that one falls under dude seriously. So we need to watch out for it. And uh, this is one way that you can look at your risk chart and kind of see as your, as your project evolves, what should I be looking at? How often should I be looking at it? And it's also really easy to communicate out to stakeholders. So this is a good tool. Yeah, it's a really good visual tool. I call it a risk matrix and uh, really, really good for um, showing for, for um, decision makers to take decisions. Um, yeah, so you identify the risk, you assess them, and then now it's time to manage the risk or to, to uh, mitigate the risk. And um, first of all, you can accept risk and take no action, uh, sometimes risk can be good. And uh, if uh, the business impact is minimal, uh, maybe this is a good idea. Uh, you can also try to eliminate the risk and, for example, remove it from the scope or lift it out of the scope. Like if you are having a fixed price on the larger part of the project, but if you identified a critical risk, you lift it out and and uh, try to work with that on a running account basis, for example. And uh, you can limit or share the risk, for example, by just by working agile, I think. That's a, uh, that's a really good thing in that in, um, in kind of uh, sharing the risk between you and the client. Yeah, so. Yeah, let me tell you a true story from the reality about uh, risk management. This was um, some years ago. Uh, we were approached by a television network and they wanted to build an online community where users could upload and share video. And um, we identified the encoding of videos as a critical risk. Different video cams have different formats and to encode these formats to, on, to the site was uh, at that point time quite tricky. We found a third party component on the market, but we had no experience from using it. So to uh, reduce the risk, we suggested further research. But um, the client uh, wasn't interested and they found someone else who could take care of the video component part. Um, but what happened? Of course, it uh, uh, went very bad. It took a very, really long time and uh, it didn't really work and the project was late. So, I was quite happy. I didn't hold the bomb there when, when, uh, when it went off. 
But uh, still, it's no fun to be in a project where things don't run smoothly. And um, I think it can affect your business long term because the project went bad and uh, the client, you're part of the, the project. And a lesson learned for me with, with this story is that communicate the risk to all partners. No, don't just use it for yourself, for your estimate, or for your, for your internal planning. Uh, take the risk matrix and send it out to all, all parties in the project. Yeah, and um, finally, let's look at some of the usual suspects in the Drupal-specific projects here. And uh, the first one, the user interface is easy to change, or I fix it later. This, um, it's always a huge risk postponing, and uh, it's a good thing if you work Agile or with Scrum, you always uh, uh, have a review and a demo in every sprint, so, so watch out for that one. And uh, the second, the API is stable, and the integration should be easy. This is, uh, this is a mistake I made several times to underestimate, uh, to underestimate integration. It's uh, really hard, and sometimes you have to reach out to a domain expert and, and seek help before, before even starting. Isn't it out of the box? A client, it happens, a lot, uh, you, it, it happens to me a lot that the clients expect more functionality. And uh, I think a, a way of handling this risk is to educate the client and be really clear about what's not out of the box. And um, there's a module for that. This one is really interesting because there are so many m modules and there, I, I think there is a module for, for almost anything. But as you probably know, uh, just because there is a module, is it, it isn't quick fix. It can be a dev version uh, and so on. Yeah, so. Okay, so let's, let's talk about techniques. So we've covered what is it, why do we need it, what are we going to use it for, how to properly plan and avoid pitfalls of the risks, what are the common ones. Now let's actually talk about some techniques that you can use to estimate your projects. And who's still awake out there? Can I see? Okay, good. Everyone's still awake. Good. Okay, so I'm going to steal the clicker. Thank you. So, first of all, Questions. What are they? How do they work? What do I use them for? When? Uh, help. Okay, we're going to help you. So, next. Estimation is like a walking stick, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's like a walking stick for a blind man. You can use it, and it will help you to not walk into a wall, but it's not going to give you sight, said old Chinese proverb. It's Shannon, but... No, maybe not. <laughs> we can't remember. She wasn't sure it was just her, so we wrote that. So it's an say. old Chinese proverb as far as we know. Okay, oh. so we've got three example techniques for you today. And at the BOF that we're holding tomorrow at 11.45 in Athens, we will do some examples. We'll do some run-throughs. So if you're really interested in trying out some of these techniques, be sure you come tomorrow to the BOF. So the first one, ballpark, top-down estimation. Who has used this before or knows of it? Can I see some hands? Okay, so I'm surprised not to see more hands because I think this one is really, really common. People are like, oh, my client needs an estimation. He's got a few things. Uh, he wants to know what the budget is going to be. I'm just going to give him a ballpark answer. Maybe I'm going to ask my developer if I'm a really good, cool boss or cool project manager. I'm going to go and ask them. But this does not always happen. Sometimes people just guess. Well, in many cases, you maybe get a request by email someone and say, we want to build this site. We have this much money. And you can easily in your head do the math and realize, no, that's never going to happen. <laughs> So you wonder, okay, can I, can I talk them into sort of lowering the scope somehow? Uh, so I think this one is actually applied way more common than you would think. Mm -hmm. So the way that you would use this correctly would be to um, assemble some of the features and discuss it with your team. I would say more than just the developer, because as Jacob rightly pointed out, there's a lot more that goes into an estimation than just the real work, in quotes. You know, all of the coding and the PHP and the testing that's not everything. There's peripheral things that need to happen. So I would estimate it with your team and put together some guesses. And the reason why you do this is to really just get a ballpark vision that you can use strategically. This is not something that's going to be super accurate, super long-term um, useful. So it's a short-term solution. Next, you have the weighted estimate. 
So this one is a little bit more it's a, detailed. How many of you know of the early estimate lecture I did yeah, in Copenhagen so in Chicago? Lots of people have <clears> seen this. This is very similar. Yeah, you take the features, you figure out how to do them, what, what actions you need to undertake, and then you figure out how long it would take to complete each action. And then the, the point here is just to try and break the project into all its parts and see where, what things could be potentially hard, difficult, so forth. You put them in a matrix like this, you estimate them, you type in the likelihood that it's going to take longer than that, what we call the confidence here. In my version, it's called degree of experience. It's the same thing, more or less. And in the end, you get a, you, you get a range you know, of hours. This is really useful to level set expectations with your client as well. So you're not saying, it's going to take exactly 46 hours, and this is exactly when we're going to do it. This gives you a little leeway where you can actually be realistic when you're setting expectations and say, look, we think it's going to take from this to this. This is reality. We can't predict everything that's going to happen. This is our guess. The problem, though, is that the customer is going to think, oh, yes, they can do it in 300 hours. You know, like <laughs> 450, yeah, yeah, you know, that will be a brief. Everything over 300 would be a, a failure at least for an inexperienced customer that doesn't really understand how to read this. True, true. So the final method is the Delphi method. How many have heard of this? Oh, more than I thought. How many have heard of planning poker? OK, so a lot more than you. They're the same thing. This was actually invented by the Rand Corporation in the 70s, but it's, the idea is the same. Mm -hmm. More heads, more brains, more brain power, better results. Right. So, oops, I accidentally skipped this guide. So what you're going to do is put um, a team together of experts who have experience with a specific feature that you want to estimate. And in planning poker, they're all going to explain their estimates, and you're going to try and come to a consensus. Generally, so, you have a stack of cards. You have a yeah. scale. And everyone gets a vote, but you don't see what the other person is voting until they put the cards on the table. And if someone puts a 2 and someone puts a 20, then you know that you either there's either someone that the person with 20 know or doesn't know, or the entire user story is not clear enough, or the, the, the requirement is not clear enough. And then the point is for them to discuss until they can agree on the estimate. You don't move on until everyone is, agree is in agreement. I feel this, uh, this estimate is good enough and accurate. Exactly. So finally, when should you use what? And these are just some indications that you can take away with you. So ballpark top down. That's when you want strategic decisions. You're looking for decision making, not accuracy. Um, so the pros, it's easy and a fast solution, but it's a short-term solution. So do not do a ballpark estimation and use that throughout your entire project. Please, you'll make can your I developers build, very sad. Can I build an e-commerce site in 50 hours? <laughs> sort of that. Then you have the Delphi method for specific features, and you need several experts to do it. It's going to be smarter and more accurate. But it's going to be feature specific. You can't use this and develop an entire project estimate. You need to reuse this several times <coughs> in order to get a full project solution. We're um, going to uh, we're going to discuss uh, the problem with estimates too. Yeah. We're going to get to get to that in more detail. And finally, you have weighted estimations, which is what Jacob explained pretty well. So it's used for um, getting a variance, like a, a range of things that you can work with. But the only drawback is that it takes some time. But you know, you can use it to help level set expectations. <clears throat> okay, so can you overestimate? Well, the, the answer is obvious here because I basically told you that you can. So what <laughs> happens when you estimate usually is that you start off, you really have no idea what, what you're working with, you learn more, you try to think about potential solutions, you try to make educated guesses about the customer's expectations. The problem with this is that the more you work, the more confident you get. Your confidence goes up as the purple line shows. But the problem is that the more confident you get, the more likely is the fact that random things will affect your judgment. So your estimate will actually get worse the more you work with it. It's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been actually observed in many, many cases. So it's actually better to just put a reasonable amount of effort into your estimates and not too much, because that can actually give you worse results. Don't get too comfortable, I think, yeah. is the takeaway. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I mentioned that we're going to talk a bit about the don'ts of estimates. And I know that many people think that estimates are a really bad idea. And often they are. The idea that we could early on look at a project and based on a lot of variables, we have no idea what they are, come up with a number for a customer, yeah, that's often a pretty ridiculous idea. Estimates, though, they are useful. 
They can be, they can be used as a means of communicating something, setting expectations. If someone comes to you and wants an e-commerce site done, a simple estimate will tell you that it's probably going to cost them at least 1,000 hours, because you know that e-commerce sites are they're business critical, you need a high degree of reliability, quality, testing, and so forth. So estimates serve their role. But what's, what's often the case with estimates is they're used for people higher up in management to get people that do build exercise to commit to estimates and then use that to, to push the blame when things aren't delivered on time and so forth. Yeah, the whole, you said you were going to do it in 15 hours, and now you're not done, and it's 15 hours. Oh, my God, what's it's, happening? Yeah. This is not to be done, people. Don't do that. It's not going to help your team, and all you're going to do is demoralize everyone in that project. Secondly, it's important to realize that a lot of features are like icebergs. You'll only see the top of them. And imagine you're on a ship at the North Atlantic, and there are tons of icebergs and a lot of fog. First of all, the icebergs you see right ahead, you know that they're bigger than they look. But the ones way ahead, you can't even see them. Um, and in many Azure projects, you start with a backlog. And something, one of the ideas of Agile is that you learn more and more about the project as you go on. You, know, you make decisions as, as reality becomes apparent to you. What I've done at one point was that I sat down with a customer, and they said, yeah, we have 1,600 hours. Can we feed our backlog? So I sat down with our, one of our developers, and we estimated the entire backlog at detail. But I realized what I was doing. I was doing waterfall by Agile. I was doing waterfall project management in an Agile project. A water agile. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's important is to actually to accept and get the customer to understand that you can probably plan the next sprint or the sprint after that. It's like, it's like firing a tracer bullet and see what's ahead of you. And that's as far as you can get. Everything ahead of that is just, are just epics. And you can just make educated guesses and try and, like, like we said here, work with risk management. To sort of to deal with these, but you can't you can't make any you can't make anything nearly even nearly accurate, <coughs> and nearly accurate statements about these things. Yeah, you don't know what problems you're going to hit until you're actually in the water, zooming towards that giant iceberg, and then you can you can figure out how to mitigate the risk. Which is yeah, why you can peer down yeah. into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> is like yeah. we're going to die. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I that's hope really you're not yeah. Titanic. <laughs> so those are some some estimate issues, and the last one. Don't do it in a vacuum. Don't, don't do it by yourself. Neither, neither should a project manager be all by themselves, and a team of developers should not be if you're by an, If you're a project manager, don't make estimates. Yeah, just don't. <laughs> Ask your team. It's not your job. It's not your, you're not the one doing the work. You're not the one who can say how long this is going to take. Get your team together, more than just development, and discuss it as a group. This is the only way that you're really going to cover all of your bases in estimation. So if you're just going to your development team, you're making a mistake. If you're just a project manager, you're making a mistake. It should be a group effort. It's, 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 uh, a lot of us, we're specialists. We really burn for what we do. But that also makes us vulnerable, because we also look at, you know, if, if all you have in hammer is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's especially true in this case. Developers think they can develop themselves out of problems. Designers think they can design themselves out of project problems. Project managers think they can plan themselves out of problems. So just relying on one of your one of the people that in your team with expertise will make you blind to all the alternative solutions there are. So finally, our, our takeaways. We've got some things that we want you to remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, what, so do you want a disc beat or something? <laughs> yes, I wanted to like, do a, a <laughs> hypnosis thing. Everyone, watch my hand. Now yeah. remember this. <laughs> okay, so first of all, management by estimate. It's a very bad idea. This is what we were talking about, where you're using management of your estimates as a blame factor. You said 15 hours. You didn't do 15 hours. It's your fault this project failed. That's not the right way to motivate your team, and it's not the right way to get better accuracy on your projects. All you're going to do is create a culture of fear, where people do not want to even estimate. They're afraid that you're going to point the finger at them and say, you're wrong. You're putting responsibility on them in a, in a way that makes them at fault, where the better solution is to focus on lessons learned and to focus on trying to find techniques and identify the reasons why the estimation was off. So that's, that's number one. Yeah, and estimates should include more than just development. Like I said, it's uh, it, do you have to show, you remember all those five bubbles in that big arrow, that stuff, and also make sure you involve people that do all of those parts. 
And they're just more than numbers, like, a, like in the case of before. Estimates communicate to the customer how you perceive their problem, and it, it tells them how you would go about solving it. So remember that even estimates have a subtext. They actually carry a message more than the number, more than the sum itself. Yeah. And uh, risk management. Yeah, use it to avoid the problems you can identify. It's, uh, sometimes I ask the developer how long, how long is it, how long, so how long is it going to this take? <laughs> and uh, I get like, oh, it's 20 hours, but I forget about the, the, the risk it may uh, include. So it's really good to, to discuss it with the, with the team. Yeah. Just add one quick note to that. When you're doing this you know, risk analysis and risk assessment, you've got your pretty little chart. You don't just want to identify them you know, and, and try and say, oh, well, I think it's going to be huge, so I'm going to put the impact as five. Really try and understand what is the impact. Is it, if this thing breaks, d does the project lose all of its value? What really is the, the monetary impact is something you can measure as well if you know the value that the client has provided. So there's lots of ways that you can use this really to, to increase accuracy and to prepare for the inevitable problems that might arise. Yeah, and sometimes it's worth just avoiding something altogether. It's just going to lead to trouble ahead. And I'm just honest. Just say no. Just say no. <laughs> All right, roll the move, roll the film. You're in charge. Didn't you want to do the last thing? Sorry? There's two more. No, we've done all the four. Oh, did them. Okay. Yeah, we've done all of them. All right, um, so we've been kind of last to ask you to review this. Tell us what you think about the session. So if you have a camera, you can. Take a picture of the QR code or just type in that address to the, in the browser. But you need to log into the Drupal.com website in order to be able to provide session reviews. And when you go to that link, there should be a button or a tab, or a tab somewhere you can click and sort of review this session or something. I'll give you a second to take a photo. Please do review. We're really yeah. interested yeah. to get feedback. Good, on our... bad. Yeah. Only good. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> All right, time for questions. Um, so Check the Twitter feed. Yeah. So while Shannon is checking the Twitter feed for all your questions, now it's time for the panel part. Can we move to the next slide? All right. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a shameless plug for a buff tomorrow. If you want to discuss this more, if you want to discuss the, the complications of doing estimation in Agile projects uh, and, and the parts that we'd like to talk a lot more about the problems with estimates, the benefits of estimates, when to use estimates, what are estimates to use, come to our bath. We're going to do some uh, estimation. We're going to show some estimation techniques so we can practice that and we can have a, a good discussion. And it's a lunch. It's a lunch break, so feel free to bring food. And we'll have an estimation lunch. <laughs> All right, time for so questions. This is still loading. So um, we got to put the mic back there for questions. Yeah. So why don't we... Do that. Did you guys tweet some questions? Hand if you tweeted a question. OK, I see about two questions. Good audience. Uh-oh. <laughs> really, everything we said was right. OK, awesome. Oh, OK. So we'll start with this one from this lovely young man who just popped up here. So um, what ways can you suggest getting, quote, buy-in from new clients when we're explaining the agile process? That's a great question. So basically, what can we do? to get our clients to accept Agile? Um, there's lots of things. I think the, the how, many minutes, how much time do we have? I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions. My, my general answer to this question is that waterfall is, is usually about an, um, an incorrect assumption or perception about control. Like, you as a customer, you as a customer are in a better position if you can control more factors. That control, however, is, 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 is a complete illusion. A lot of products are driven, are driven about requirements. And I did a session in Vienna about this called Upgrade Your Offer. And I believe we as group of companies need to focus less on requirements and more on the kind of business value that our solutions bring our customers. And it's when you should focus the business values, you're going to realize that the requirements are just secondary. They're just one idea how to actually bring the, that business value about in a website. My suggestion is that you throw out the requirements and you sit down with the customer and try to figure out what is the business value. 
eventually you'll see it's a pretty concrete thing. It's a number. You can see the write-off of that investment. You can actually translate it to actual money. And in that, when you do that, then you can see what, what's, what's a reasonable budget. A lot of customers, they haven't even done this work. They haven't even thought this far. Because the strategic reasons for building a website, building internet, are often taken at a management level. And the IT, and the IT department are tasked with you know, drafting the requirements, because they've seen so many requirements documents. Uh, and they're the ones tasked with turning to you for you to produce a number on a document which may not be relevant at all. And so the, the big case is, is saying that projects which are focusing on, on business value and are on agile in their nature will deliver better results. They will actually deliver what you, I, I mean, essentially, if you can't deliver everything, what should you focus on? And there's really no way of knowing it unless you know the actual business case for a project. Yeah, so try and understand what, what does your client want? Why are they there? Where's the value? And I would say, if you can, try and start small. Start with something that's going to provide value yeah. for a, a small amount of effort so that you can start off with a win and you can gain that trust. Because I think one of the reasons people shy away from Agile is because they're very afraid of the risk. And as Jacob was saying, they, they don't know what to expect. And so they want to plan everything out. Yeah, but if you can get a win, then you're going to gain some client trust and you'll have some capital to work with. Especially in experienced buyers. Um, there's a book called um, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And he talks about something called the minimum viable product. You can build Drupal sites almost the same way. You can take a feature, a blog for example, and you can make a simple blog using fields and, and views and you can just have headlines and, and pictures and no we we editor and you show the customer, this is a blog, it took us two hours to build. Is this what you need or do you need anything else? And it turns out this fancy blog that they're, maybe their advertising agency come up with isn't really necessary at all. This simple blog with a bit of theming will be to deliver the actual business value. That will achieve what they need to do. It will, be, it will cover the needs of that certain target group and it, it, will, it will fulfill the needs in terms of user experience. It's very hard to, it's very hard to have an opinion on something you cannot try. And if you can build a prototype quickly in Drupal, which we can, because Drupal is an amazing prototype new tool, the, the, the customer can make the decisions early on. And they can decide right away, okay, we're going to scrap these requirements. That is something they could never do with a, with a, with a waterfall. That's, a, that's something that agile methodologies provide uniquely. Okay, we got another question here. Um, so how do you deal with what seems to be a habitual tendency for engineers to underestimate the amount of time needed to deliver? So basically, why are you engineers not giving us numbers that are high enough? Blame game again. <laughs> but you have some pretty good techniques uh, for that. Well, I think, first of all, having a risk management discussion with your engineering team is one way to make them understand that everything is not peaches and roses. Things are going to happen. Things are going to go wrong. And you need to discuss that with them so they think about the impact. And you're not just saying, OK, well, I'm not very comfortable with this estimate, so I'm going to add like 45 hours onto it just in case I really screw up bad and need to cover my butt. What you want to do instead is say, what is the actual impact? What do I think this might set me off? And if I don't know, then maybe I should look into it a little bit instead of going into it blind and just saying, I think I'm just going to slap on all these hours. Do a little bit of testing. Do some prototyping. Get some experience and find out, even if it's just you know, for your own knowledge, you know, what, what is the potential impact of this? Try and learn something before you, you take that leap, I think is the, the safest thing to do. Um, so definitely discuss it with your team and do some critical thinking instead of just oh, I don't know, I'm scared. That's not going to help you in the end. I think the best advice I can give is sort of bring the team and customer as close together as possible. Don't be some proxy between the, the customer and the team. Estimation by proxy, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Also, um, planning poker is a really good, um, good thing because uh, when, when we started to work with planning poker, the estimates were more, much more accurate than before when we when we didn't work with planning poker, so. Yeah. And we're going to do planning poker tomorrow uh, in the buff, if you want to see how it works. Yeah, if you haven't done it, this is, this is the opportunity to try it with a bunch of people who also are excited. Yay! <laughs> um, so. Are you saying the teams aren't excited? Well, now maybe they are. Now, raise your hand if you're excited to do estimation. Uh, okay, well, maybe half of you are. You need to come to the buff, and then you'll all be raising your hands, yeah. emphatically, both of them. 
That would be chocolate. <laughs> we'll go buy some chocolate now, apparently. <laughs> there will be. Okay, so how about another question? Um, Pre-project workshops are very helpful with more accurate estimates, but how can we help the client understand that? So basically, doing discovery before the project is, is helpful. How do we convince the client that this needs to happen? Shannon doesn't want to talk so much. So. Well, I can, but I'm hogging the mic. <laughs> She's hogging the mic. Well, so, so can you repeat the question? Um, how do we convince clients to do discovery? How can we convince clients to do discovery? Well, uh, what we've been doing for a long time at, at Node One was that we've been doing pilot studies. We basically what we called we did a we did a we did a we suggested a solution, almost like a recipe, and and the reason that this the work we do here is going to be valuable to you regardless if you turn to us or another agency. Essentially, you're going to have a roadmap for building your site in Drupal, and we're going to use our expertise to help you figure out all the all the traps and, you know, and, and pitfalls and everything. And that worked pretty well. In most cases, in almost every case, they actually turned to us to build the site. But they, they, delivered, we got a, they got a document from us which wasn't just, which was actually genuinely, actually had actual value for them. So if you can sell your discovery as that, as a sort of a, a pilot study which will help them get better prices and save money in the long run, then they would gladly pay for it. But it takes, takes some sales work. I think it's a good idea to show some of the work you've been doing for other clients, uh, if it's possible, because then it's much easier to understand for a, for a new client or a potential client that, oh, this, um, uh, this um, free project workshop can really be, uh, you can get out so much information from it and you can use it, either you choose to work with someone else later or if you continue the cooperation. How many of you here use workshops as a way to get requirements in place? Okay, cool. I, I, think, I think workshops are, 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 super, are, are super because the customer gets involved too. And if you can involve the team, even better. So that, that, that's a advice, piece of advice I can give you. More workshops. They can also use it for marketing sometimes. If they're, if they're doing that workshop and like talking to users, that's also a great way for them to gather information directly from their base. So there's lots of avenues for marketing that, you know, solution to your client. Okay, so another question. Any preferred tools for risk management um, during estimation? I'm going to put together some of the uh, different resources and give that information at the BOF. So if you want them, you have to come tomorrow, yeah. basically. You get, her, you get her super cool spreadsheets. <laughs> yes, we've got some spreadsheets that we'll yeah. share. So. Um, Let's see here, what's another one that we can ask? So, how do I manage the sales team when they want me to reduce my estimate? <laughs> sales is like, no, that's too high. That's out of their budget. Well, it's like, what did I say to the rest of you? It's like a bus. Like, you can't <laughs> argue with the weight of a bus. A bus weight, weighs a certain number of times. An estimate is a certain size. You can't negotiate with it. If you want, it's like a negotiation. If they want the lower price, they got to give something else. That would be reduce the scope or something. Yeah. Like, like, like you, you told me a great example. Uh, actually, you had it. So, yeah. do you remember what you said before? No, I don't. Oh, oh, I remember. <laughs> I'm going to quote Matthias. Um, so he said basically that you should only, um, you know, negotiate how much you're going to do. Negotiate on the effort, not on the on the actual value of that effort. So, if if your team is coming to you and saying, you know, 25 hours is too much for X feature, then say to your team, okay, how can we reduce the effort necessary to produce X feature instead of, okay, well, I guess we'll just knock off 15% because we need to come in under budget. That's the surest way to be wrong, absolutely wrong in your estimation. And, you know, either that's a risk that you're willing to take as a, as a you know, shop for your client, we're going to accept the risk that we're going to be probably, you know, wrong on this estimate, and, and we're going to eat that. But I don't suggest that solution. I, I think it's better to go back, negotiate with your client, and say, this is a problem. We need to reduce scope because we think, for X, Y reason, this is going to be too much effort for what the value that you're talking about. So let's find a way to either, um, you know, share the risk. We'll do 10 hours free. 
you do 10 hours paid, maybe you change the scope, change the architecture of the solution to make it simpler so that it does fit into your scope, or maybe you just go straight out to your client and say, look, this isn't gonna work. Um, how would you like to handle it? Because we don't wanna take on the risk of, of this thing becoming giant and having to fix it ourselves because that's not fair to, to us and our business relationship. And estimation is also not just something you do. If the, the, customer, if the customer can actually estimate the business value, you can wonder like if a project would bring them maybe 2,000 money something in terms of value, maybe that's not so smart to, to have a budget of 1,000 to build that project. But if the ratio is more like one to 10, the project will build 10,000 money something, 10,000 euros of value and cost you 1,000 to build, then it's a much easier equation. So do that math and wonder like, like how close do you want to cut it? Okay, so let's, let's do one last question. Um, so this one is, how do you combine a requirement for a fixed price with an agile development planning approach? So basically, how do you do agile when you have a fixed budget? I think this is a really, really common situation. In the BOF that I had yesterday, we had this question as well. So thank you. Uh, we tried this. We've been playing with different versions here to try and get customers to sign up to this. And I would say, don't. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, like something's got to, okay, if you have a fixed budget, then you've got to have a, f a fluid scope. You can't have both or fixed schedule. and be, you can't be or agile. Quality. Then it's not agile. So be honest to yourself. Like, and get the customer to realize that the importance is to deliver the things like I showed in the, like I showed in the, the quadrants before, the diagram. The ones at the top left. Focus on the ones that least effort, more, most value first. And then cut, cut the not so important stuff. And that means if you, you can't commit to the scope. <clears throat> yeah, your client needs to understand that it's give and take. They cannot have all the points of the triangle yeah. all the time. Yeah. If they want a fixed budget, they're going to have to be flexible on other things. And they need to agree to this from day one. If they don't, then I would say don't do the project because you are going to really be hurting at the end of that because you're going to have to take on all of the risk of you know, building this thing that you, you have no control over because your client is going to dictate your scope to you. So I've seen this happen, and it's a really tough time for the team. I don't, I don't think you should do it. If you can change the fact that the scope is you know, unfixed or say, okay, but guess what? For this fixed budget, you're only getting our intern. Where you may take a hit on quality, but they'll work as much as you want. I don't want to be an intern at your company. <laughs> <laughs> oh my no, God. It's an example of, of another way. If you have you know, people that you're bringing up and teaching, maybe if you've got this high risk, fixed budget project. Yeah. You can bring in someone with less experience who you know, presents more risk to the client and say, okay, if you, if you don't, are not going to pony up, then we are not going to you know, take the time from our best developers and put all of our other projects at risk. Because when one project goes in the red and you have to you know, try and save it, sometimes other projects can be affected by that, like we saw in the ABC you know, diagram. So that, that's probably yeah, sir. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It's, uh, it, it is a problem because a lot lots of the tenders you, you get, you have to come with a fixed price. And at the same time, a lot of companies and organizations want to work agile. And it's kind of, a, it's kind of in a twilight zone now. And, <laughs> and um, it have to be, you have to be clear about some of the, of the lowest pr prioritized stories are are not going to happen in the, in the, uh, in the project. So, that's so that, I don't think we have time for any more questions. No. Well, we have more, there are more questions to answer. So come to Buff tomorrow and ask all you want. Yeah, we're going to take um, some of these other questions offline. So I think um, next slide will show what we need to show. Who's got the clicker? Well, Where's the, we lost the clicker. Oh, the speaker's here, Chen. <laughs> but what information do you want? We have the, we have the buff oh, information here. Oh, you to it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, tomorrow, 11.45 to 1 in Athen is our buff. Come to it and talk to us, tweet to us if you've got more questions or things that you want to discuss, or come find us. We're going to be hanging out for a while. And I think that that's it. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>